In Tbilisi, Georgia's capital city, on the balcony of his family's home, sits a 12-year-old boy immersed in thought. It is nighttime, and the garden below is bathed in the soft light of the moon. The only sounds are the gentle rustling of the leaves and the distant song of crickets. Surrounded by the darkness of night, suddenly, the boy hears a voice inside him. Look up at the heavens. He gazes up at the sky, and there, behold, an immense cross shining with an otherworldly light. I did not know it then, but now I know. That was my cross to bear for the love of God and my people. He would recount many years later, reflecting on this event. This cross represented the many trials, struggles, and persecutions this boy would endure throughout his difficult life. It would also be a means of salvation and would prove to be mightier than the principalities of this world. In a time of darkness and godlessness, when under the yoke of oppressive Soviet atheism, many people had forgotten about God. This little boy, the future Saint Gabriel of Georgia, was to become a pillar of faith and love that would lead thousands back to Christ and His Holy Church. Just eight years before St. Gabriel's birth, in 1921, the Soviet Red Army would subjugate the Republic of Georgia and install an aggressive atheistic government. Joseph Stalin, a native of Georgia, did not spare his homeland. In 1923 alone, over a thousand churches and monasteries were demolished. Many other holy places were turned into community centers, theaters, and warehouses. During Stalin's reign, around three and a half thousand members of the clergy were purged, either exiled or simply executed. By 1953, the year of Stalin's death, there were only 45 functioning churches in Georgia. Another way of discrediting the church, besides the intense oratory and written propaganda of the communist regime, was the unveiling of the graves of the saints, as they sarcastically called it. This was the opening and desecration of the graves of Orthodox saints, to prove to people that there was nothing holy or supernatural about them. So fierce was the atheistic oppression that people's faith was crippled and the church was on the verge of ruin. St. Gabriel was born on August 26, 1929, and was given the name Goderzi by his parents Basil, Basiko, and Barbara, Urgebadza. He was the youngest of three children. Soon after Goderzi was born, his father was killed under mysterious circumstances. It was evident from early on that little Goderzi whom people started calling Basico after his father, was not an ordinary child. He was a quiet, serious, thoughtful boy 
gentle and loving towards everyone around him. He got along with his peers, but preferred to play alone, away from the noise and antics of other children. His favorite game was building little churches out of pebbles and using matches as candles. This was curious since little Vasiko knew nothing about God at this point. His family, even though baptized, did not lead a religious life. They wouldn't even mention God for it was dangerous to do so. Vasiko was to learn about God through a strange series of incidents. He was seven years old when he overheard two neighbors arguing. The one said to the other, You've tormented me like Christ on the cross! This aroused the boy's curiosity, so he approached the man and innocently asked, Who was Christ, and why was he tormented on the cross? But the man was frightened to speak of Christ, and told Vasiko to go to church and find the answer to his question there. The boy rushed to the nearby church full of curiosity, but it had been shut down by the communists. At the entrance stood a guard. Desperate to find answers to his burning questions, Vasiko questioned the guard about Christ. The man, moved by the boy's innocence, led Vasiko into the church, showed him the crucifixion and said, This is Christ on the cross. If you want to know more about him, you have to read the life of Christ. This greatly intrigued Vasiko, who left the church with even more questions, determined, however, to find the book, The Life of Christ. He had 70 rubles saved up, so he grabbed his money and rushed to the book market. There he went to all the vendors asking for The Life of Christ, but none of the merchants had a book with such a title. Starting to lose hope, Vasiko approached the last vendor. The old man handed him the New Testament, asking for precisely 70 rubles in return. Vasiko took the book and headed home, but along the way, he started doubting if he had purchased the right book, for the one he was holding in his hands was not called the Life of Christ. He rushed back to the market, but could not find the old man anywhere. He went around asking the other vendors if they knew where the old man had gone. But nobody knew who he was talking about. No one else, except little Vasiko, seemed to have seen the old man who sold him the New Testament. Vasiko returned home, and from that day on he immersed himself in the book. His young heart began to burn with love for God as he learned about Christ and his teachings. As days passed, this reading moved his heart to start talking to God. He prayed more each day and began to deprive himself of comfort. He ate and slept very little, spending his nights conversing with God. It is a mystery how young Vasiko understood how to live a life in Christ at such an early age. At that time, people had become very secular. They had stopped venerating icons and ceased going to church. Vasiko, on the other hand, would go around his neighborhood and ask people to give him their unwanted icons. He even knew where the icons were stored in their homes. Then he would take the holy images to his room where he would carefully clean and cherish them. He was often seen going through garbage and rubble from destroyed churches, searching for discarded holy objects. By the age of 12, he was already known in the community as a saintly child. People had began to notice miraculous events occurring around this peculiar boy. The Second World War was raging at this time, and people who had lost contact with family members realizing that Vasiko had strange supernatural gifts, would come to him, and the grace-filled boy would reveal to them information about their loved ones. Vasiko refused any praise or gratitude from people. Instead, 
To humble himself, he would stand in the garbage and say, Always remember, Vasiko, that you are garbage and never think highly of yourself. Many years later, when his half-sister Julieta was asked about her earliest memory of Father Gabriel, she responded, I remember Gabriel clearly from when I saw him fly into the yard. It's from that moment that I remember him. He flew in with his arms and legs stretched out like wings. I was about five then, and he was twelve. Seeing this, my father wept bitter tears thinking Gabriel had some kind of problem. No one could understand him, and I remember my reaction. I was amazed by what I saw. We had two very devout women living next to us, Nina and Maro. They said in amazement, with fear of God, Vasiko is a servant of God. Meanwhile, Vasiko's mother, Barbara, was increasingly worried about his well-being and safety. One day, she confronted him, calling him a fanatic. Why do you have to be interested in nothing but God and religion? She cried. Little Vasiko could not understand his mother's worries. For him, Christ was his life, and nothing else mattered. Seeing that he was unwavering, Barbara even resorted to beating him for his disobedience. Nothing she did worked. So one day, overcome by desperation, she grabbed his New Testament and threw it into the trash, saying, This has ruined your life! That was the moment that Vasiko realized he had no choice but to leave his home. He took the holy book out of the trash and carefully cleaned it. He then packed a few of his belongings, and while everyone was asleep, he took off, holding the New Testament close to his chest as he quietly sobbed. As he walked the dark streets of Tbilisi, his heart filled with great sorrow and loneliness. The twelve-year-old boy was comforted by the words of Christ. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Young Vasiko walked for two days until he finally came to the ancient monastery of Samtavro in Mitsketa. The name Samtavro means ruler's place, for this is where in the fourth century the Christian king of Georgia Mirian and his wife Nana were buried. It was also here that Saint Nina, equal to the apostles, had built the first church after arriving in the ancient kingdom of Iberia. Saint Nina was the one who enlightened the people of Iberia, modern-day Georgia, bringing them from the darkness of paganism into the light of Christ. The nuns of Samtavro warmly welcomed the wandering boy. They fed him and gave him a place to rest, but he could not stay there for long. This was a woman's monastery. This saddened Vasiko, for he felt a strange connection to Samtavro. Before he set off, he prayed before the icon of the Mother of God, asking her to let him live there. Little did he know that wish would be granted many years later. Next, the road took him to the monastery of Svetitskoveli. The monks welcomed Vasiko, but unfortunately, there was a law forbidding children from living in monasteries. Due to this, Vasiko was forced to keep traveling from monastery to monastery, only staying a few days in each. Finally, he came to the Betania Monastery, where he met two holy monks, Elder John and Elder George. The Holy Fathers immediately recognized the tremendous spiritual potential which the young boy possessed. As he stayed with them for two weeks, Vasiko also came to greatly respect and love the elders, and looked to them for advice and guidance. 
They showed him the way of monasticism, teaching him about obedience, prayer, and repentance. For the future Saint Gabriel, these two men would become the solid spiritual foundation, preparing him for the many trials that awaited him. The young boy developed an especially profound bond with Elder George, who became his spiritual father. After two weeks of living with the Holy Elders, the time came to leave. Vasiko would often visit Bethania throughout his youth, always finding guidance, spiritual advice, and unconditional love in the Holy Fathers. Little Vasiko returned to the snow-covered Tbilisi in the middle of winter, where he wandered the streets alone in the freezing cold. One day, a woman named Margot saw the boy sitting lightly dressed in the harsh weather. She approached him, and after finding out that he had run away from home, Margot invited him to stay with her. Vasiko, seeing that the woman was a kind and genuine person, consented. But soon, he discovered that Margot was a prominent fortune teller. This greatly saddened the boy, but after praying about it, he understood that he should be patient and wait. Many people came to Margot for help, and Vasiko would quietly observe all her sessions. One day, Margot fell ill with a bad cold. She was distraught, for this meant that she would not be able to see her clients and would have no income. To her surprise, Vasiko offered to see her clients himself. She hesitatingly agreed, and Vasiko seized the opportunity. He took all his icons, spread them on the table, and then called all the visitors into the room simultaneously. The confused people gathered around the unusual boy, while Margot was watching from the other room. Vasiko began preaching to them about God and the Church of Christ. He explained that meddling in witchcraft and consulting fortune tellers exposes them to demonic forces and that they should repent and return to Christ. He then began to describe to each of them things that no one else could have known, intimate secrets and even future events that would happen to them. He later explained what had happened in this way. The Lord made my mind such that I knew them all by name, and their lives were revealed to me. Seeing that everything Vasiko was saying was true, the astounded clients gave him large sums of money for this extraordinary and unique spiritual session. Vasiko turned all the money over to Margot, explaining that what he did was with the authority of Christ while her actions had been leading people down a dangerous path. So impressed was Margot that she gave up fortune-telling altogether and became a faithful Orthodox Christian. After three months of searching for him, Vasiko's mother finally found him at Margot's home. Rejoicing at this, she promised to no longer interfere with his spiritual life and apologized for mistreating him. The young boy was finally back home, where he continued his ascetic efforts, each day growing closer to God. When Vasiko came of age, it was time for him to serve in the military, so he enlisted. Soldiers were not allowed to leave the base, but providentially, Vasiko was given the job of a courier. This allowed him to leave and attend all the liturgies while on duty. The priest would secretly give him Holy Communion in the altar. It did not take very long for Vasiko's comrades and superiors to notice the young man's deep faith in God, and he was reported to the communist authorities. So, after completing his military service, he was sent to a medical commission where he was declared insane and unfit for work in any rank of importance. 
The reason for this, they explained, was his belief in God and the childhood visions he had experienced. Because of this new diagnosis, Basiko was stigmatized by society as well. He could not get a job, and not many people would want to be seen with him. But deeply in his heart, Vasiko yearned to become a monk. Joining a monastery during these challenging and dark times, however, was exceedingly difficult. Having plenty of time on his hands, he would diligently attend every service at the Sioni Cathedral in Tbilisi. This caught the attention of the Patriarch, who quickly realized that this young man was anything but ordinary. After finding out that young Vasiko knew the Georgian ecclesiastical language, Patriarch Melchizedek III promptly made him a reader. During his service at the cathedral, Vasiko developed a close relationship with the Patriarch, who had big plans for him. In 1953, the year Joseph Stalin died, Vasiko was tonsured a subdeacon, and only a year later he was made a monk with the name Gabriel. Soon after that, he was ordained a priest, which was a rare occurrence in those days. Hieromonk Gabriel spent the next six years serving with the Patriarch, while living in a small hermitage he had built with his own hands behind his family's home. In 1960, he moved to Betania Monastery to be with his beloved spiritual father, Elder George, who was nearing the end of his days. One morning, when Father Gabriel was away serving at another church, Elder George realized that his time had come and asked to see his spiritual child for the last time. So deep was their spiritual connection that Gabriel, while serving the liturgy, suddenly felt an intense impulse to go see his dear elder. Upon finishing the liturgy, Gabriel rushed to the monastery as fast as he could, where he found Elder George close to his death. He fell at his elder's bedside, and with tears in his eyes, he was listening to his last words. The holy elder told young Gabriel that the road ahead would be full of sorrows and challenges. But he also encouraged him, saying that the Lord was with him, and that Christ would help him bear it all. Elder George passed away in the arms of his beloved spiritual son on September 21st, 1960, and Father Gabriel returned to his small hermitage in Tbilisi, pondering on the last words of his saintly elder. Both of his elders, George and John, were canonized by the Georgian Orthodox Church in 2003. It was the morning of Holy and Great Saturday in 1965. Father Gabriel left the church after the liturgy and headed across town. From a distance, he saw the main square of Tbilisi where a massive crowd had assembled. It was the annual International Workers' Day celebration, the most important holiday in the Soviet Union. Thousands had assembled to watch the parade and celebrate communism, the Soviet religion. In front of the masses, on a tall building, hung a portrait of Lenin, two floors in height. Above it, the inscription, Glory to the Great Lenin. This sight profoundly disturbed Father Gabriel, and at that moment he made a decision. He immediately ran back into the church, grabbed a flask of kerosene and matches, and set off straight for the portrait. Suddenly, at the height of the celebration, as a government official was delivering a speech, the gathered people gasped and shouted in alarm. Panic spread as huge flames engulfed the portrait of their adored leader. 
To the crowd's bewilderment, a figure in a dark robe appeared in a window next to the burning image, addressing the crowd with a clear and resounding voice. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. The crowd below was getting angrier by the second. Undeterred, Priest Gabriel continued with an even stronger voice. Glory is due not to this corpse but to Jesus Christ, who trampled down death and gave us eternal life. As these words were leaving his lips, he was violently dragged from the window and onto the square. The enraged mob brutally beat him, almost to the point of death. Gabriel's skull was fractured, and 17 of his bones were broken. If it weren't for the police, this would have been the end of his earthly life. Years later, when asked why he took such a risk, he would say, I am a pastor, and I was entrusted by God to care for his sheep. They erected an idol and wanted to make the people bow down before this idol. This is a type of the Antichrist, an image of a man, or rather of a beast, and the communists wanted to give him the honor that belongs to God alone. I could not allow this to continue. Following this event, Father Gabriel was taken to prison, where he was intensely interrogated and tortured daily. The authorities wanted him to publicly announce that the church authorities were behind the incident. They promised to spare his life if he would publicly apologize and admit that he had committed this reprehensible act under the influence of the Christian religion. But no matter how severely they tortured him, Father Gabriel remained silent. When asked about these interrogations in later times, he would only say, human nature could not bear those horrors if it were not for God's help. At one point, as Father Gabriel silently prayed to endure this unending torture, he had a strange vision of a glowing number seven. The saint instantly understood that this meant he would be released in seven months. After this, a peculiar thing happened. Some of those who tortured him returned and secretly apologized. Soon after, he was moved from isolation into the general prison population. At this point, one would think that his troubles would only increase. But on the contrary, many of the prisoners grew fond of the saint and would guard him against fanatics. Throughout his imprisonment, however, Gabriel continued to be tortured and interrogated by the authorities. It would have been safe to assume that Father Gabriel would eventually be executed, but instead he was transferred to a medical institution, where his suffering only increased. There he was given the following official diagnosis. Psychopathic personality, with a predisposition towards psychopathic outbursts of a schizophrenic character. At age 12, he imagined he saw an evil spirit with horns on its head. The patient insists that the evil one is responsible for everything wrong that happens in the world. He believes in the existence of heavenly life, God, angels, etc. The psychopath's main axis of conversation is directed at the belief that everything happens according to God's will, etc. Whenever anyone tries to talk to him, he always recalls God, angels, icons, etc. Because of his unwavering faith and fearlessness in professing his beliefs, Saint Gabriel was again labeled as a lunatic. But he was only a fool for Christ. 
precisely seven months after this earthly hell began, a friend of Patriarch Ephraim II, Avlipi Zurabashuli, a famous Orthodox medical scientist, managed through his powerful connections to get the authorities to release Father Gabriel. One of the conditions for his release, however, was to be suspended from the priesthood. This hurt him more than all the tortures. Broken and humbled, Gabriel returned to the only place he had left in this world, his beloved hermitage in Tbilisi. At this point, he had become an absolute outcast, a pariah, People feared associating with him, and many considered him completely insane. But Gabriel was strengthened by the words of Christ. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. For Gabriel, this had a special meaning but not an easy one for a secular person to comprehend. Henceforth, he would take up the heavy cross of the fool for Christ. By acting insane, Gabriel would hide the multitude of his spiritual gifts. He kept growing closer to God by rejecting this world, remembering the words of the great Apostle Paul. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Saint Gabriel would often be seen wandering the streets of Tbilisi in rags, barefooted and seemingly drunk. He would attract crowds which would laugh, mock and call him names. The saint was unfazed by this and would even dance and sing operas, greatly amusing the spectators. Many years later he would explain, When it seemed to me that I was an important person or that I was better than others, I would act that way. And when people would laugh at me, I would be humbled and see that I'm garbage. Through this seeming madness, Gabriel received amazing spiritual gifts. He often warned people of future events. To others, he would point out sins they needed to repent of, or he would reveal the deepest secrets of their hearts. Some would only realize years later that the words of the holy fool were prophetic. One day, a group of young men decided to visit Elder Gabriel's hermitage. When they arrived, they spotted the saint in front of his cell, swaying drunkenly with a bottle in one hand and a cup in the other. The elder called the young men closer, poured himself a glass, and downed it. He continued toasting and drinking cup after cup while giving them advice. Each young man heard the words Gabriel was saying differently, each hearing something beneficial specifically said for him. One of the young men from the group was especially disturbed by his strange behavior and looked at the monk angrily. As the group started to leave, Gabriel, suddenly, with a very serious and sober face, calls over the upset young man. He hands him a full cup and lovingly says, Have a drink, my dear one. The young man hesitatingly took a sip and was stunned when he tasted cherry juice diluted with water instead of wine as he thought. Don't judge any of God's creations, said Gabriel. If I start judging you and consider that I'm better than you, I will be abominable before the Lord. Remember this, my dear one, and go in peace. For Saint Gabriel, this was a period of extreme asceticism, intense spiritual warfare and spiritual cleansing. 
He would only eat a little dry bread and water once a day, and he would wear heavy chains around his body. He slept very little, never lying down but only sitting on a stool or in a hole in the ground. The saint's family would often hear crying and lamentations coming from his cell for hours on end. For a while, he even lived in the cemetery in an empty tomb, eating only what people would leave him out of pity. Throughout this time, the local authorities would not leave him alone. They would frequently bring him to their offices to harass and intimidate him. The saint would often return from these interrogations severely beaten, barely able to stand on his own. Due to his suspension from the priesthood, Saint Gabriel could no longer serve in the holy altar with the other priests. But instead, he would have to receive the Eucharist with the congregation as a layman. He saw this only as another opportunity for humbling himself. But soon, even the consolation of the holy mysteries was to be taken away from him. One day, Father Gabriel was summoned by Patriarch Ephraim II to discuss his hermitage. The Patriarch solemnly announced to him, The government is furious about your chapel and demands that it be demolished. These are bad times and we can't struggle against them. You'd better tear down your chapel. When times change, you can rebuild it. I won't do it, Gabriel replied. If you let the atheists have their way, they will demand that you remove the cross from your chest. How can I destroy what I built to the glory of God? But seeing that the patriarch was himself in a difficult position, he gave in and agreed to do it. A few days later, the patriarch came with the authorities to ensure that Gabriel would do as he was told. He obediently started tearing down the first two reception rooms. The communist officials, satisfied with the progress, departed with the Patriarch. But as soon as they left, St. Gabriel stopped demolishing the building. He left his cell and the chapel intact. The officials soon got wind of this and Patriarch Ephraim again summoned Gabriel to demand an explanation. I told you to tear it down. I, I tore down what I did because you were there. Those were bad times. But then, a few days passed and the time came to rebuild. So I rebuilt. What could I do? How could I destroy what I built to the glory of God? For this blatant defiance, Gabriel was excommunicated from the Orthodox Church. This devastated him, but he simply could not betray his beloved Christ, no matter the cost. The Soviet authorities soon came and demolished his hermitage. As he and his younger sister watched, he said to her in a strangely calm voice, Don't worry, sister. Today they rejoice, but tomorrow they will sorrow. Today I sorrow, but tomorrow I will rejoice. The demolition crew loaded the ruined hermitage on trucks and took it away. But Father Gabriel, undeterred, loaded it and brought it back, stating prophetically to his sister, who was strongly protesting, they have done what God allowed them to do. They can't destroy anything more. Indeed, a little while later, the local party administrator herself came to see him. But instead of being angry, she was contrite and apologized for what they had done to him. She even offered paying to have everything reconstructed. But Father Gabriel politely refused the offer and found other ways to rebuild his cherished hermitage, which still stands to this day and is a place of pilgrimage for today's Christians. During the following years, St. Gabriel, 
still ostracized even by the church, put all his hope into the Lord, praying that one day he would be allowed back into the body of Christ. Five years had passed since his excommunication. Then, in October 1971, things began to turn around for the suffering saint. One night, Gabriel had a dream. He described it this way, I saw that I was standing in the church, at the place where the robe of Christ was buried. It was morning, and the patriarch was about to arrive. All the clergy were gathered to meet him. The bells could be heard, and finally the patriarch entered the church. Then he entered the altar. Suddenly, as all were quiet, the Savior himself and the most pure Mother of God entered. They came up to me, told me to go through the royal doors into the altar, and placed me before the holy table. Then the Savior looked at the patriarch, motioned to me with his hand, and said, I will only accept the sacrifice from him. I awoke, and my soul was consoled by this dream. I was in a blessed state. I felt hope that something would change for the better. Immediately following his dream, Father Gabriel prepared himself for Holy Communion and the next morning went to church. There he saw the patriarch, who seemed a bit uneasy. This indicated to Gabriel that perhaps he too had seen something the night before. Soon after, he was asked to put on holy vestments so that he may participate in the divine liturgy. His dream was being fulfilled. After the service, Patriarch Ephraim II, having restored him back to the priesthood and full communion with the church, appointed him the spiritual father of the seminary and the convent in Santavro. Father Gabriel greatly rejoiced, for this was beyond anything the humble ascetic had expected. During the year he spent in Santavro, Father Gabriel developed a strong bond with the sisterhood. But when Patriarch Ephraim passed away, the new Patriarch, David V, was elected. Gabriel was removed from his post in the monastery, and so he returned again to his beloved hermitage in Tbilisi. From 1973 to 1987, Father Gabriel spent most of his days in his little hermitage, but also frequently visited Santavro, where he would stay for extended periods. It was during this time that he also went on many pilgrimages around Georgia, visiting churches and monasteries destroyed or abandoned during communist rule. Father Gabriel was known by many as the eccentric, unstable, drunken monk. But all who got to know him closely quickly saw through this facade and grew to love and respect him for the simple monk radiated with the Holy Spirit, even when acting in the most bizarre of ways. Metropolitan Seraphim Jojua describes his experience of Saint Gabriel in this way. When I saw Father Gabriel for the first time, I thought, this is a chosen one of God. This could be felt in everything he was. The elder never remained indifferent to other people's woes, and he could console the offended and the suffering for hours. Seeing people's deep sorrow and unhappiness, he would start sobbing and praying fervently for them. He said, If we help each other, then God will be merciful to us. He has given us an opportunity to do a good deed. Through his gift of discernment, Father Gabriel was also able to sense any kind of insincerity in people. 
At times, he would give the vainglorious people tough lessons in humility. This happened once during a festive meal of priests. He began running around with his arms raised, shouting, Vainglory! Vainglory! He often showed foolishness for Christ and could do the oddest things. Sometimes he would scold people using terrible, indecent words. Or, just imagine, he would do somersaults in church during the liturgy, rolling around on the floor. It was a scandal to many. They didn't understand what was going on. One day, my friend, a good artist, stood with his friends at the gates of Santavro. He was very young then, and they were discussing how Father Gabriel did somersaults during the liturgy. There were five or six of them. They said amongst themselves, Well, we know that he is a saint, but the others don't know this. What do they think? There are limits. How can he do it? The liturgy is going on, the bloodless sacrifice is being offered, and he is at the Amvo doing God knows what. Suddenly, as they are talking amongst themselves, a taxi stops. The elder gets out and walks right up to them. They are standing in a circle. He thrusts his head into the circle, looks at them in the face and says, are you judging me? They were all stunned and didn't know what to say. Then the elder calmly walked off. A servant of God by the name Revaz recounted his incredible encounter with Saint Gabriel. In the late 1980s, my family was on the verge of ruin because of my chaotic life. There was not a single day when I didn't drink alcohol. I also took to gambling. I lost my job and friends. My whole family suffered from that. Deep in my heart, I realized what state I was in. But I was unable to control myself. Most likely, I was already getting used to this kind of existence. I was told, and I myself remember, that I had lost my human appearance. Everything around me annoyed me, and at some point, I began to feel as though I was unwanted. Back then, I wasn't seeking any spiritual refuge, and it didn't occur to me to go to church since I didn't take the clergy seriously. This would have gone on for years if, one fine evening, Elder Gabriel had not gone into the beer house where I, drinking another glass of beer, was preparing for a reckless and cruel act. Yes, dear friends, your ears haven't deceived you. Elder Gabriel was there, although at the time I had no idea who he was. I had never seen him before. This is how it happened. Amidst a great noise, I heard the clear, loud, angry voice of a man demanding that beer and vodka be poured into the largest glass. Otherwise, his heart would break and he was willing to pay any sum. I have money! Parishioners have donated it! The man repeated in a thunderous voice behind me, with people laughing and looking at each other contemptuously. At that time, I didn't know the meaning of the word parishioners. In addition, I was sitting with my back to the man, not really interested in who he was. I remember one thing for sure. I imagined the man as a tall, coolly dressed rebel who, like me, was drowning his sorrows in wine. The voice wouldn't stop. Sounds of swallowing and some screams could be heard. And all of a sudden, the rebel began to sing a Georgian song so beautifully that I turned involuntarily and behold, I see a shortish, gray-haired priest in rags, standing in the middle of the beer house, spreading his arms as if he were drunk. He was making dancing movements in time with the words of the song. The whole beer house fell silent and was staring at him. 
and he was gazing right at me with his big, extraordinary eyes. Suddenly, he drew close to me, looked right into my eyes and said, Revaz, burn what you have here in your pocket. Then hit me on the chest in a showy way, raised his hands to heaven, and made the sign of the cross over me in a split second. It all happened so quickly that the visitors didn't even notice that he had made the sign of the cross over me, and many, including myself, thought that what he did was some kind of dancing movement. Soon, the elder finished his dance and walked out of the bar to applause and comments by the clients. Such a nice person. Well done, Father. Wow. I was standing dumbfounded, with tears in my eyes. But I wasn't crying because I had understood the meaning of the elder's actions. I was crying, rather, because his words struck me like a surge of electricity. And I kept wondering how he could have known what was in my pocket. What I had in my pocket was a suicide note, written a few hours earlier in which I was saying goodbye to my family. I was about to commit a terrible, irreparable act. But Elder Gabriel came, by the will of God, and made such a show, especially for me. The most amazing thing was, from that day on, I didn't want to hear about gambling anymore, and I gave up alcohol along with the disordered lifestyle I had led for years. I went around to Tbilisi to find that priest, but to my disappointment, he was nowhere to be seen. I asked many people and heard the same answer everywhere. He is a madman who doesn't always appear, they would say. Soon, I converted to God and began to go to church. But a few years later, when my family and I traveled to Mitzgeta and visited the Samtavro convent, on one of the graves where people were crowding, on a large photograph, I saw the very man who had saved me and sobered me up. I stood rooted to the spot and tears welled up in my eyes. The elder was smiling at me from the photograph and I smiled back at him in response after he had given me a wink from the portrait. In 1987, St. Gabriel's childhood prayer to the Theotokos, in which he asked to be allowed to live in Samtavro, was finally fulfilled. The saint moved back to the monastery, this time permanently. He settled in an abandoned hen house on the monastery grounds, where he continued his ascetic struggle, despite his deteriorating health. He guided the sisterhood on the narrow path of monasticism, showing them the way to salvation, often through challenging lessons. But the nuns obeyed him in everything, recognizing their elder as a spiritual giant and a true man of God. The holy elder was the strictest with himself, depriving himself of every comfort and eating next to nothing, but he did not expect the same from his spiritual children. Instead, he would encourage self-restraint and moderation, and ascesis only according to each person's strength. In 1990, around the collapse of communism, Father Gabriel decided to withdraw to the Shio Migvimi Monastery, seeking complete solitude. He was there only for a few days, when behold, Christ himself appears to him, ordering him to return to Samtavro, and serve the people. His own desire was solitude, but the will of God was different. Gabriel immediately obeyed the Lord. He moved back to Samtavro, into a cell in the old tower, and dedicated his days to serving everyone who came to him. He wanted to be cut off from the world, but the world needed him more than ever. As the communist government collapsed, people were now free to find Christ 
and Saint Gabriel was like a lighthouse, shining the light and love of Christ, welcoming everyone with open arms. As the end of his earthly life was nearing, Gabriel's health worsened. He suffered from a severe case of edema, and about a year before he reposed, he also broke a leg, which caused him to be bedridden. In 1995, on the Feast of the Transfiguration, to which Santavro's church is dedicated, Elder Gabriel asked that his coffin be brought out and placed in front of his cell. As a crowd of pilgrims, priests, and bishops entered the monastery for the celebration, they found the saint lying in his casket, announcing, Not many days will pass, and you will see Monk Gabriel in this state. I take with me love for everyone, the Orthodox people, and every person. This was to be his last act of holy foolishness. After this, he became very serious as he prepared to stand before the throne of God. His mother, upon hearing that he was dying, came to visit him. In her grief, she began to lament, saying, Your whole life has been nothing but suffering and pain. Those words saddened Gabriel, who replied, You still don't understand me. I could not have lived any other way. On November 2nd, 1995, as Saint Gabriel was lying on his deathbed, he suddenly focused his eyes ahead. The people attending to him could hear him saying, I have been following you from the age of twelve, Lord, and now I am ready. Take me to yourself. After this, he spoke no more. His family, the nuns of Santavro, and his spiritual children surrounded his bed. Archbishop Daniel read the canon for the departure of the soul, and as the last words of the prayer were spoken, Saint Gabriel, with a gentle smile on his face, peacefully gave up his soul to the Lord. The fool for Christ, the wonder worker, priest and spiritual father, was buried on the grounds of his beloved Santavro Monastery, wrapped in only a simple shroud. The funeral was attended by hundreds of faithful, along with His Holiness, the Patriarch Ilya II of Georgia. In 2012, he was officially numbered among the saints of the Holy Synod of the Patriarchate of Georgia. His feast day is celebrated on November 2nd. In 2014, St. Gabriel's relics were translated, and thousands of faithful attended a procession to transfer his relics to Tbilisi. Unlike before, when images of dead ideologues like Lenin were honored by the people, this time the people of the resurrected Georgia carried banners of the life-giving cross. The grace of God has not abandoned Gabriel, even after the departure of his soul. At his relics, endless miracles frequently occur to this day. The sick, the troubled, and the downtrodden all find healing, comfort, and consolation upon visiting Saint Gabriel. Be humble, kind, and loving before every man born into this world by God. I carry away with me love for everyone, both for Orthodox people and for every man born into this world by God. The purpose of life and of this whole visible world is the acquisition of the Kingdom of God. By drawing near to God, 
and inheriting eternal life. I wish this to all of you. I leave you with my blessing that no one loses the great mercy of God and that all of you be accounted worthy of the acquisition of the kingdom. There is no man living who will not sin. I myself am a great sinner, unworthy in every way and extremely weak. I beseech you from all my love, when you pass by my grave, beg forgiveness for me, a sinner. Dust I was, and to dust I have returned. The truth is in the immortality of the soul. Saint Gabriel, confessor and fool for Christ, pray for us during these latter days.